Um, I'd just like to introduce now our guest and the first guest of the Impossible Word series, who we're extremely pleased uh, was gracious enough to join us. So, Mr. George Eliot Clark is a poet, and correct me if I'm wrong with anything, please. Uh, George Eliot Clark is a poet, playwright, literary cr critic, and educator. Correct so far? Yes. Raised near Three Mile Plains, Nova Scotia, much of Clark's work explores and chronicles the history and experiences of black Canadians um, in Eastern Canada. He is the author of ten books of poetry, four plays, and a novel. That's when I was kind of worried. <laughs> um, uh, Clark is also the recipient of numerous awards, including the 2001 Governor General's Award for his poetry collection, Execution Poems. It centers on George and Rue Hamilton, two of Clark's cousins who were convicted of murdering a taxi driver in New Brunswick in 1949 and executed for the crime. Uh, he teaches currently at the University of Toronto, correct? and he'll be reading from his recent verse novel, I and I. So everyone, please give a warm welcome to Mr. George Elliott. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, Johnson, I'm supposed, to, I'm supposed to read from this book. Is that it? All right. You don't have to. You can read whatever. Huh? <laughs> well, I suppose I should. OK. Um, and uh, I hope I'm holding the microphone at an appropriate distance, et cetera, et cetera. And there's no <laughs> feedback and all the rest of it. i just say very quickly what this book is about. I and I is um, it's deliberately written to be a kind of a, of a comic book, um, and a, a comic book story about two young lovers, teenagers, 17, 18, from Halifax, who uh, court, fall in love, uh, and, and eventually move to Corpus Christi, Texas, where uh, Betty is assaulted by an English professor, uh, and then Malcolm, uh, her boyfriend, her lover, has to go and chop up the English professor with a machete, which he does. Uh, and and uh, uh, he, gets, he gets caught, and he doesn't make any real attempt to get away anyway, he gets caught, and he gets put on death row in Texas. But this is set in the 1970s, so he can bust out of prison, and he does, by hiding in a garbage truck, which is how people did it back in the day. Uh, hide in a garbage truck and break out of prison. And so that's what he does. That's what, and so they meet up again, and together they make their way northward to Canada and cross the entire country back to Nova Scotia, where the story ends tragically. Uh, the whole thing is written. <laughs> the whole thing is, is written in poetry, uh, and it's, it's meant to be vivid and it's meant to be uh, uh, well gothic a little bit too. So anyway, um, I'll begin by reading a, a little bit about um, uh, the courtship of the two. Uh, Malcolm's also a boxer in, in uh, uh, Nova Scotia, 1974 is when the story begins, uh, and he's 17, going on 18, and his love interest, Betty, is a student, a uh, high school student, who gets a, a, a scholarship to go to Bible college, and that's why they end up in Corpus Christi, Texas. Anyway, so, uh, romance number one, April, 1974. April opens with clustered, lustrous snow and a million blasts of rain. Plucky springs upsurge through muck until tiny, fragile flowers blare rainbow trumpets rousing up grass. In the public gardens where she's often cantered past on horseback, Betty watches geese besiege the clean park. Parliament the clear pond, while on its fringes pigeons waddle overfed despite prohibitive signs. Though this April remains unheated, sunshine gilds the gardens. Human music intrudes and Betty twirls about. Ogles and Orpheus pertinent in his whistling. Like marbles, the notes roll sparkle in undulant air. Malcolm seesaws as he strides, like a rodeo dude or a jack tar. Betty recalls they both took English last year when Malcolm would recite comic books in class, spurring the paperbacks of classic verse, a schoolboy's rebel act. Here he's slick, a down-home East Coast soul man, and a prize fighter, black leather come to life. In the sports news, Betty's seen him dance erect, slender, pretty, while cornered fools drop. On television, he shows us belt power, flashing that onyx patina, prancing on boxer wiry legs, jabbing, dabbing, and bouncing. Up close, Malcolm looks a glistening black stallion. All Betty's thoughts of him slant into italics. 
Um, this is uh, called Girl Talk, and in this piece, uh, Betty's talking with another friend of hers, Joyce, about, well, everything. Uh, Girl Talk, <laughs> April 1974. Betty tells Joyce about her accidental date, and her gal pal Lairs confides, I'd like the lick of that garrison, knocking <laughs> slick sidekick out of New Orleans. I bet he kisses ooh la la French, and I like his funny sayings like, Café Gourmand don't mean greedy coffee, but you still got to drink it greedily. In her ma's kitchen, Joyce uncorks wine. Ain't no bouquet or cachet, it's just red wine. The young lady sip, as sly as a cat's. Joyce's eyes glance sideways. Hmm, maybe we can all skylark as one, you know, a quartet. Betty serves up the fulsome and relaxed smile a non-committal politico also wields. Joyce ooze. Saw Malcolm's last fight last month. His sorry foe jiggled like a frayed to dick. Malcolm preached up a fit of prayer. His fool stunts down on his knees. Next, Malcolm's hands go boom, boom, bam, bam. Betty, it was a two-fisted twist ending. Joyce laughs. Betty smiles. Their goblets click. Here's to Cura Vida. Joyce squints at Betty. Yo, man's a downright pretty lightweight. Oh, Betty yeah, answers, yeah. no, he's not my man. Joyce tees, keep him because it ain't mass produced. <laughs> by, the, <laughs> by the hairs of my sweet snuggly snatch, I'm not going to catch that garrison right off the street. Betty can't help but laugh while swiveling her head in amazed full critique of Joyce's lewd rap. Let me speak nakedly. Me and him and you and your brash foe could mount a, a noisy cathedral, play organs unto full volume orgasms. Betty says nothing, her orange blush says everything. Joyce giggles, I'm just teasing you. She pours out a jugular of murder red wine, two glasses, kiss, kiss, and concord. Indulgence in the world, bets that be living. So uh, I'm going to uh, go on here with a little bit more of this. Oh, man, thank you so much. Um, remember, it all, it all ends tragically. <laughs> it's got to end tragically. Uh, so there's a little bit more of the romance. This is uh, called Loverly, and it's Betty speaking about her uh, feelings for Malcolm. She says, fresh night is wild, a pagan hue, a hint, the tint and blueprint of you. Night is dusky, mathematics. I plus I make one matchless ethics. We form an us, oh, small sweet world. Night comes silken, smoky, joy unfurled. And here is Malcolm reacting to Betty, and his uh, piece is called April Ballad. <clears throat> How earthy it is to see love in cool grass. With gypsy accoutred she, ah, how her hips hold sway. Meltingly she opens heaven plus hell unpins. Her bronze here a pillow where swell kisses wallow. Or insects when we loll in woods or let sand spill upon us on a beach where love oiled limbs outstretch. Though April is cold and buffeted by snow, wind, rain plus gold daffodils, our lips never feel chills. When we stand under stars and loosen silk and furs for Roman hands and Russian fingers and French fashion, leave our forms half unclothed but deep in kisses bathed. Later we notice scars of grass and seed and tears. Stained we are but unscathed we fall like two flowers signed. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's, it's Oh yeah, Caledonian News, July 1974. I gotta read this. I gotta read this because we do we do weird crime in Canada. We do weird crime. That's our contribution to the world criminal scene. We like to do weird uh, all, most of the time. I shouldn't. I won't. I know I shouldn't get into all that because we we can start talking seriously, and you can all think about headlines uh, and so on. I don't want to remind us of some of the terrible stories that have happened here, but it's a um, they actually make sense. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. It's all weird. Anyway, Haligonia News, July 1974. The North End Pulse loathes Huckabuck so much that after he's been bullet shattered, buried, they dig him up, knife out his eyes, blast off his cock, turn him over, shoot him in the ass, like how Lorca died. Axe off his head, plant a penile spliff in his mouth. 
Then trundle this macabre assembly in a wheelbarrow through Uniac Square. They dump the crimson mess into Halifax Harbor, that sewage lagoon. They treat Huckabuck like Pope Formosus, who nine months worm-eaten was resurrected and put on trial for heresy. His death had indeed bumped his infallibility. His reeking corpse, propped up by sticks, was harassed with theological disputes, but he remained fiendishly silent despite the obscenities his flesh sustained. Judged guilty, his maggot-riddled body was stripped of its papal robes and jewels. His fingers were locked with an axe, and he was flung into a pauper's grave. But the Roman mob, still furious at Formosus, pitchforked up his corpse again and, ch and chucked it into the Tiber River where it floated, a gall carnival, until a priest dredged it from a sewer and wheelbarrowed it to a garbage dump. But Formosus' skull leered with delight when his successor and prosecutor, Pope Stephen VII, after the cadaver signed on in 897, was strangled by unknown hands. Huckabuck's head wound up stuffing the belly of a sizable Newfoundland cod. A fact read into the Nova Scotia Hanser, the Journal of Assembly Debates. All true stories. Uh, and onwards. Uh, so they go to Corpus Christi. They go to Corpus Christi, Texas, and where all hell is going to break loose. And, uh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, I got to read this little piece about Lal Beersley. Lal Beersley is my villain, and he's an English professor. Lal, Dr. Lal Beersley, PhD in anatomy. Corpus Christi is, let's face it, a weird name for a city, but peculiar to Texas where too many Christians are just well tanned charlatans like good old Garter Ted, preaching Armageddon but banging church ladies like there's no world tomorrow. <laughs> Ain't this a homey setup for Doc Beardsley? A D. Lau's lumberjack with a doctorate, Lau Beardsley is a half Canuck from Maine. He is so homely you get eye strained seeing him and fall asleep. But then you have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I haven't read this in a long time. <laughs> but then you have a nightmare that shocks you awake. His bus, his bus saw voices, chainsaw smile, mimic Leatherface, conductor of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He veritably froths at the lips like precise grammarians to denounce poorly worded poems. A name whiz on religious rhetoric, he's written the book on fundamentalist grammar. Lau Beardsley, B A M A P H D. Bad ass. Monstrous ass, philandering derriere. <laughs> As come to Corpus Christi and God Ferry, Texas, to escape those malevolent maples of Bane, occupied by inbred woodsmen with bugged out eyes, ketchup blood smearing their underwear, drool slurring and melting down words, his boyhood home was really a burn. Shotgun shacks, shotgun weddings, shotgun deaths, those ugly Bane smells of burlap sack and potatoes, that brown dirt creation, the wrinkled fields, Vistas of tar paper shacks shivering with incest, where daddy dun daughters breed mongoloid mongrels, illegitimate babes that rats chew on legitimately. Lao knows too well that main tombstones double as mirrors. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a Stephen King country. Stephen King country. Name. Name. Stephen King country. That's it. Uh, Stephen King rules Maine. Uh, and for good reason. Anyway, um, so uh, the English professor attacks and, and uh, attacks Betty, and so Malcolm's got to go and get some justice. He's got to go get some justice and wield that machete. And so this is the murder scene, Lyle Beardsley, 1934, 1974. Malcolm bowls the machete into Lyle to put the kibosh on him. Lyle's mouth looks hot and raunchy inside an adult genital pink. As Lau cringes, winces, inches backward, hands and arms up, taking hacks. In freaky transformation, a scarlet mouth opens in his belly. Sinister moistness shits out. Voluminous drool runs down. Cuts leap about like roaches. Lau's nick degenerates into beef. Influx of blade, efflux of blood. As Lau is put down like a broken legged horse, chintzen, crimson chips fling out. Red junk swivels from the man, swipes at light. As Malcolm punches through Lau, he glances almost interested in a full-length mirror and smiles. He incarnates J.J., that brown clown from good times, but a J.J. caught in the act of butchering Jimmy Hoffa. Yes, a man is being hacked to death, but Malcolm feels that it's practically fun, if lousy. But he keeps picturing the scholar ramming his cock into Betty's sweetness or saintly body, and his rage is such that though he should feel tired waving the heavy iron blade about, and driving into a fat, struggling, and gory form, the blade feels light, and he's lighthearted. Now Malcolm locks three fingers on the prof's right hand, and while Lau, howling, inspects the stumps, 
The boxer slices sideways into the man's gut, so spleen and bile spill out like sausages, a mess. Liquid arcs out scarlet. The man's spectacles leap, fly free, shatter spectacularly into a few splinters of see-through shadow. While Malcolm slashes him once more, Lal hosts one last thought. I was in the middle of doing something. What was it? Was it life? Living? His fingers let go. His bowels let go. He is gone. Coming on midnight, it got worse. The lightning got worse. Bisecting a green-black sky and smashing clumps of rain against windows. In the heavens, lightning cracks and the dark night parts. Aquarius sheds his glowing tears. Um, after uh, Lau is, is uh, executed, well, murdered, uh, essentially, and Malcolm goes to death row, he has a vision of hell. And he has a vision of, of uh, Beardsley in hell. And that's what this next uh, uh, sequence is about. And I hope, it's, I hope I can read it clearly enough, because you've got to picture this in your mind. So, five minutes? All right, that's fine. That's fine. So here we go. Um, there are phony prophets and false poets, et cetera, et cetera, where he goes in, in hell. And so <laughs> to, he sees a singular gurgle of fire from which an unsavory shape and insect posture waddles. Malcolm's eyes seek out the others and disgust, revulsion, repugnance provoke a nauseating realization. He is sort of face to face with Lao whose deformed so his spine curves reptilianly to tuck his head past his genitals, so that he peers up at his own ass and glances up at Malcolm. But Lau's bat-like needle-toothed tubular mouth showcases his freakiest self-sabotage, an ominous gag or rather a quixotic fix. He weeps and says, no, sputters, splutters, don't gulp, make, cough, me, slurp, speak, spit. Incredibly, as he articulates, Lau defecates. And so, in the spaces between each morphine, Lao must munch his own anal mush to the extent that his words must be translated like Morse code bleeps and blips. Indeed, everything Lao spits out, he shits. He must consume <laughs> what he spews. He grazes, feeds upon his own corpus of the scourging of his bowels. And so his speech is whimpers and mumbles, a bubbling blunt prattle that doubles as a discourse of diarrhea he both orates and ingests. The cursed double has a squish has to squish his words out edgewise, slip them between each infernal dribble and deposit, but he does not mulch with tongue and teeth. Sworn as I am to punish racists and rapists, I command you to mouth your pollution with infinite exasperation, here diluted, treat it with translation, Lao mutters pungently, frivolous than yours, all I communicate, patois mixed with poison, as the words sound, fresh turds plop into his mouth. Uh, I'm gonna end up. I'm gonna end up uh, with a with a slightly nicer accent uh, from this from this uh, book, which, by the way, is illustrated. Uh, in this, uh, I just want to point that out because the uh, original idea was that this would be a, a kind of uh, graphic novel, but the publisher didn't have enough money for that, so I just had to settle for a few a few drawings here and there. I think there are seven throughout the book. Anyway. Uh, done in a kind of graffiti style. So, uh, to end up, finally, uh, and uh, to read something a little bit nicer, maybe, from this book, uh, uh, Accidental Photographs, which actually is a weird thing to end up with, but I will end up with this. Accidental Photographs, and this has to do with that experience we've all had of uh, basically walking into somebody else's photograph. Uh, as the camera is taking the picture or the camera phone is taking the picture, you somehow manage to get caught in there. You didn't mean to, maybe, but you got caught in there anyway, and so you're forever there. Anyway, accidental photographs. And how many photographs do I, and this is from Malcolm, and how many photographs do I, an odd Odysseus, appear by accident, having blundered into a stranger's focus, just on the verge of the view, when the shutter snapped its trap and captured tentative my face, Half earth, half either, blurry or oblivious, or shying away, dismayed to be the wry, awry star of such tender, veiled surveillance, yet committing by foggy proxy, adultery, bigamy, bastardy, interrupting the family portrait, disrupting the framed romance. Illustrated. <laughs> <laughs>